Good evening, everyone. Um, as you've heard, I've been visiting communities for many years all over the country and uh, all sorts of events. This is the first time, though, I've encountered an event where there are lots of trees lying around that nobody's got responsibility for. Uh, and uh, every time something happens that doesn't fit into the predicted uh, framework of government, of course, there's a massive problem. Um, who's going to deal with it? Um, and uh, it's often these things which define the particular character of uh, the recovery process. How efficiently it happens and uh, how long it takes and, and who does it. And <coughs> what I notice over the years is there is uh, a certain way in which every disaster is the same. It doesn't matter what the initial event is. Everyone involved is going to be in for a long, hard grind, uh, whether it's a couple of years or often it's uh, five or ten years, I, I have to say. In the 10th anniversary of Black Saturday, there was still a significant number of people living in uh, temporary accommodation that the councils there had made all sorts of exceptions so that people could live in their sheds, something that I'm sure you know is not uh, permitted, is it? Uh, but they made particular uh, time-limited exceptions. But when the 10-year came, there were a whole bunch of people who were still living in their sheds, so there was a whole lot of new uh, arrangements needed to be made. And, you know, people's lives, as you all know, are very complicated, aren't they? Uh, we've already got very complicated lives. We've already got lots of problems. And then you throw all these trees on top of it. Uh, so you get, you know, just unimaginable complexities. It's the complexity of the, of the human situation encountering the, the natural disaster, encountering the government arrangements. Um, so that's got a particular character which is unique for each disaster, but there are, the basic situation is the same. It doesn't matter what it is. And I'm going to speak in a minute about the impact on ourselves, the, uh, the stress response and uh, uh, the experiences we have that we have to work through. But <clears throat> what I've learned over the years is the really important time, it's not what happened back there in, was it June or July? June. June. It's what's going to happen for the next six months and then maybe the next year. Uh, that's the crucial time. Let me give you a very simple story. Um, when I uh, worked in uh, the Ash Wednesday fires, I was part of a children's hospital team working with families in the Macedon area. And there was a particular family that had a couple of kids and they uh, sought our help for oh, the, their kids had anxieties as you'd expect. And uh, we had a couple of sessions and everything was all right. <coughs> Five years later, the father of this family looked me up in the phone book Remember when we used to have phone books? <coughs> and he made an appointment and came to see me. And what he described was the following. He'd built this house himself out of mud bricks. He had a few acres with horses and lovely lifestyle. Uh, it all burned to the ground. He just managed to get out. His wife was uh, having dinner with her friends and wasn't home, but he just managed to get the kids and get out, nothing, nothing else. Um, he comes back a few days later and he's sifting through the ruins and his neighbour comes across and says, yeah, I'm so sorry, I lost my house too. What are you going to do? And he said, well, I'm going to rebuild, of course. What else can I do? And so his neighbour says, I'll help you. He said, thanks. So for the next six months, the two of them 
spent every waking minute that they weren't at their jobs earning their living up on the block rebuilding. And at six months he got it to lock up stage. And so they all moved in. And his neighbour comes across and says, it's fantastic, you're in, isn't that wonderful? And, he, and he, he says, yes, thanks so much for all your help. And the neighbour says, I'm going to start mine now. <laughs> so he, he's never experienced such a sense of obligation. So for the next six months, he helps the neighbour. So that's one year gone, isn't it? Two years later, they're divorced, they've sold everything, and he's living in a flat near the Essendon airport seeing his kids every second weekend. And when he comes to my rooms, he says, I don't understand what happened. I thought we had a good marriage, but I've lost everything. Now the loss of the house is a reversible loss, isn't it? It's difficult and painful and distressing and at the time you can't see your way through. But in a few years, you'll be living somewhere with a roof, won't you? <clears throat> but the loss of your marriage and your family is irreversible. He could remarry and have a nice family again, but he's lost that one and that's irreversible. Now what I want to emphasise is that the real problem with disasters are those irreversible losses. They might be a marriage, it might be your health, it might be your relationships with your families because there's a lot, sorry, with your neighbours because there's a lot of tensions and stresses in the, you know, the dis disasters are random and this puts a lot of stress on relationships. Uh, government assistance is supposed to be absolutely consistent and according to criteria but actually we can't get our heads around those criteria and so we often don't understand why somebody was entitled to something but I didn't get it. And that creates a lot of emotion. And if we're on a good day and very calm and rational, we can process that, but we're not. And so we're angry and upset and we say things, maybe not directly, but in the rumour mill. Do you have one of those up here? <laughs> and it gets back and they're deeply offended and hurt and, and long-term relationships break down because the differences of impact of the disaster and the government arrangements and so on are, are arbitrary in terms of the relationships. So they arbitrarily cut across friendships and, and other relationships and, uh, and, and fracture, if we're not careful, fracture the community. I call them cleavage planes. I noticed those already in in uh, Macedon and then saw them in one event after another and I remembered from my high school uh, natural science uh, you know that diamonds are very hard aren't they but there's a certain plane in the crystal structure where the molecular bonds are weak and if you hit it there you can split it you can cut diamonds uh, following those planes well the, the cleavage planes in the community will be, there could be pre-existing cleavage planes. You might have people up here that barrack for Collingwood, for example, and there'll be a cleavage plane between them and the other members of the community. But there'll be cleavage planes according to the circumstances. Who was here and who wasn't? Who's insured and who's not? Who has ha had physical damage and who on their houses and who hasn't? You know, it could, could be anything. And what we see is that as time goes by, if we're not very careful to actually remember we're all in this together and we all need each other, then this fracturing starts to take place. Theoretically, it's unnecessary, but it always happens. And so I think it's most important to have a way of getting together and getting beyond that and helping each other. Uh, <coughs> so, um, there's been, um, there's been a very useful professor of uh, political science in the United States. Not all professors I find are useful. Uh, this man uh, had the perfect start to his uh, disaster career. He moved into a new job in New Orleans uh, about a month before Hurricane Katrina. He had no idea what disasters were. He was a professor of political science. 
So when they were told to evacuate, he just took his family and went over the state border and had a nice weekend with some friends. And his house flooded to the rafters. He said he didn't even take his computer. What kind of a professor is he? Uh, so he lost all the previous research, everything he, he'd done up to that point. But he got interested in disasters. And he's done some really interesting research because he's able to sort of take in all these huge quantities of data. He came here and, and gave a uh, presentation at the State Library some years ago. And he started off by showing a huge, great big overhead of uh, a map of New Orleans. And he'd done a project where they, I think they interviewed 2,000 people. And every person was marked as a little circle on this map where they lived and colour-coded according to how severely they felt they'd been affected by this disaster. And then the background was shaded according to the depth of water. Right, can you picture that? They're all over New Orleans and you've got the depth of water. And he starts off his presentation saying uh, to this audience, what's the relationship between the severity of impact and the depth of water? And everyone looks and looks and looks and looks. And finally, somebody said, there's no relationship. He said, that's right, there's no relationship. Now, I thought, thank God for that. Now, somebody has proved statistically what uh, we who work in this area have known for many years. The problem is that when you've had massive physical damage, uh, you can't help thinking you're worst off because you feel you are badly off, and you are badly off. But we don't understand the complexity of life, of, of, of other people's circumstances. The Beyond Bushfire research that uh, Melbourne University has done since Black Saturday, it seems to be the first time any sort of research has been done on long-term effects. I think they've done a 10-year follow-up three years, five years, 10 years. Uh, <clears throat> what they found is that one of the best predictors, strongest predictors about how uh, people's mental health is, certainly at the five year mark, is whether they had any degree of separation from their loved ones at the time of the fire. Just separation. They ju just didn't know where they were or didn't know for maybe 24 hours whether they'd made it or not. Uh, and I'm going to talk about trauma in a minute, but this is a very traumatic situation. Now, you could go through that fire and be untouched, uh, but you could have thought for 24 hours you'd lost your loved ones. That's a massive and irreversible change in your experience of life, isn't it? Um, and some people will cope with that much better than others, depending on their life history and so on. So that's just one example of an invisible factor that you wouldn't know about unless you really sit down with people and go through their story. You mentioned the, uh, the floods in 2011. I went to uh, a community meeting. It was in the Maryborough Racing Club. I get to see some really interesting places. Uh, uh, and there was this uh, uh, from one of the little nearby towns that had been badly flooded. And these people were sitting in, you know, like this, except they're all cuddled up. We can't do that anymore. And uh, I was talking about the effects. And I noticed a woman sitting about three rows back who was looking really sad. Very attentive, but very sad. And, uh, you know, as I was talking um, towards the end of it, she put up her hand and said, is it right that some people who weren't actually flooded might feel badly affected? And I said, yes, yes. And I forget what I said, but I said some relevant things. And uh, she said, oh, thank you very much. We were a little bit affected. Our shed was flooded. Now, behind her was another woman. And when she said my shed was flooded, she rolled her eyes. Oh, you Poor thing, your shed was, I'm so sorry for you. Uh, and you could see how it would be easy to feel like that if you'd been seriously affected, and lost all your furniture. But because this woman looked so sad, and I saw this eye roll 
behind her. I said, we can't let that go. So I just said to her, what do you keep in your shed? And she said, all the heirlooms from my mother's estate, she died a couple of months before the floods. So, you see, she's lost history and identity, hasn't she? That's irreplaceable. Now, the eye-rolling lady might have lost some beautiful furniture that could be well insured. She just orders another lot, after a lot of palaver, of course. But <laughs> can, can you see what I mean? Now, she's very upset because she's, you know, she's lost a lot of stuff. But this other lady has lost something that can't be replaced. So these are just little examples. Now, what I want to emphasise is that I think there are three problems with disasters. The first one is trauma, which is the bad experience we have on the day, which can reverberate for a very long time. The second one is loss, what we've lost, including the loss of your environment. Uh, I actually live in the Yarra Valley, and uh, uh, where I live, just outside Yarra Glen, was uh, completely surrounded by fire. I could stand on the hill at the back of my place and I could watch the spot fires starting about five or six kilometres on the other side of town and I could see it coming down over the Christmas hills and it, it, you know, it got completely dark at five o'clock, completely dark, like midnight, for about half an hour. And the closer it gets, the less idea you have. Now, I've heard a couple of descriptions. I've done some work with the, the people in the Dand in Ongst and Kalarama. Uh, I've had a few descriptions of what it was like on that night. And, and you know, I bet you had a lot of darkness then too. Uh, you know, each, that, that, that actual quality of the, of the impact is quite different according to the physical circumstances. But, but um, you know, it's taken about, uh, I would say six to eight years for uh, the physical impact on the surrounding hills so that every time you come out the door you don't see this bushland that was so beautiful before which is just sticks and uh, jagged you know outlines and so on it's sort of coming back quite nicely now and so uh, you get this constant impact back from the environment that that you're in that that keeps you confronted with what's happened. Uh, and so th there's a loss involved in that. Uh, and, you know, we have all the other losses. And I want to come to loss again in a minute. But um, the third one is the effect that it's taken me the longest really to understand. And that is disruption, the disruption to our lives. And uh, I just want to speak about each of these three because uh, we can, if we understand these three, we can help ourselves and each other. I, I gave a talk at uh, a psychological society conference on trauma um, and they were presenting all, that, all the studies and the research and so on. And, but I gave my talk on the 80% of affected people who don't see psychologists. How do they actually process their trauma? Well, they process it by meeting and talking together because no one outside the area understands, do they? You find that? You try to tell your neighbours and sorry, your friends and relatives down in Melbourne, they don't get it. Uh, and their uh, time frame for recovery is very unrealistic. And so it's, it's the community needing to talk together and share experiences and, and help each other through it that's so important. That's why the cleavages are so damaging. Uh, and uh, what this uh, professor has proved with huge studies comparing all of the Japanese prefectures that were affected by the Fukushima uh, disaster and looking at all the places affected by the East Asian tsunami. And he's done all these studies of detailed measures. And he says, the factor that most consistently and accurately predicts how fast and how complete the recovery is, complete in the sense of how many people return to the area. 
uh, how quickly the economics get going and the whole community life gets going, is not how much money is spent or what political influence communities have, and they all have different degrees of influence, and he measures all this. It's what he calls social capital. Now, capital is having lots of money in the bank sitting there waiting so that when you, a tree falls on your house, you just take some and you pay for it to be fixed. That's capital, isn't it? Or you want to buy a new car, you, you, just, you just do it. Uh, social capital is relationships with people so that you can ask for help. You can get information. You can ask somebody where you can find out about this. Uh, you know, and, and just arrangements where people get together and work together. Uh, it's far more important than government assistance according to the measures. Uh, and this is what you're speaking about on the, on the day, this tremendous working together, uh, which I think often gives people a, a unique experience. So this social capital is the absolute uh, most precious resource that we have. And it's very important for processing trauma. Now let me talk about trauma for a moment. I better put my watch here, because I noticed that clock has stopped. That's could take a fair while to come round. You're doing fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so the word trauma means wound or damage or injury in Greek. So trauma medicine is the medical care of people who've been run over by a bus as opposed to having a heart attack or an attack of diabetes or something like that. Externally caused injuries. So for me, a psychological trauma is an experience that's so intense is it damages my ability to come to terms with it so that it appears to be reactivated and all the emotions come back every time the wind blows uh, or any other uh, sensory experience associated with it. Uh, we, we go into this, we call it a state of heightened arousal, adrenaline, uh, anxiety, uh, running around doing things. And that means we have an experience that psychologists call uh, intrusive re-experiencing as opposed to rem memory. Memory would be, wow, that's windy. Oh, yeah, that reminds me of that, uh, that storm we had back in uh, July, June, sorry, June. Oh, yeah, it rem reminds me. It's the same sort of whistling sound. That's memory because you're remembering something in the past. The traumatic re-experiencing is, oh my God, is something going to fall on us now? I'm getting out of here because I just don't feel safe, right? And I'm actually re-experiencing what it was like at the time and I'm very disturbed now. Now, that means you open up the injury, don't you? You go back there. You feel the same feelings again. You know, remember uh, when you were young and you sprained your ankle in netball or football or something and then you keep spraining it you keep spraining it and you get these chronic injuries uh, because you didn't do what your mother said and stay home is that different to a panic attack yeah yeah because the panic attack is an is an episode of anxiety that doesn't have to be connected to anything right we can have panic uh, just feel very anxious and not know where it's coming from um, the anxiety will be part of the traumatic re-experiencing, but that'll be tied to something that links us to the experience and we start to experience it again. So, uh, now there's a very interesting thing that uh, people who go through traumas don't feel safe again in particular kinds of circumstances. So when we ask what is injured, What's damaged? It's the ability to take experiences, digest them, and put them away into memory, which also includes learning from them. When people have 
traumatic stress, they don't learn from the experience, they just keep going through it. Uh, now, when this happens, we've got to identify the damage. Now the damage is to the assumptions we have about the world, ourselves, other people, nature, the assumptions. Now assumptions, we don't know what our assumptions are because they're assumed. The assumptions are built up by the repeated experiences of everything being the same every day and so you don't need to pay any attention to it. And we now know that those habits and assumptions are processed in a very deep part of the brain automatically without any attention. Uh, right, so our assumptions are that we live in a nice safe environment and in fact we don't even have that much problem with bushfires up here, do you? Yet. Uh, yeah. Right, so, uh, so your assumptions are built up on everyday experience. Um, now, I can illustrate this with a, a woman I worked with who was going to cross the, the road at a, a you know, pedestrian crossing to have lunch with her father in a shopping centre. And when the lights changed uh, for the traffic to go, somebody on the other side of the road took off at great speed, did a right angle turn across the traffic and rammed into the traffic light she was standing next to which fell on her neck. And uh, luckily the local GP was standing beside her waiting to go across and get his lunch. And so when she came to, he had his hands clamped tightly around her neck and said, don't move. And as a result, she's not a quadriplegic. She's recovered very well. But she could well have been. Now, can you imagine that this woman for a long time regarded as absolutely irresponsible and dangerous to walk down the footpath of a four-lane suburban road with her kids. Why would you put your kids at such danger? And there would be other people who would say, uh, that's a perfectly safe thing to do, I wouldn't even think about it. Because this, ca this car behaved in a completely unpredicted way. Now, I'd done some work with this lady before and she happens to be a psychologist. Some of you will say, well, that probably explains everything. But, uh, but, you know, we knew each other pretty well. And I said, what you really need to do is you need to take a deck chair out on the main road in front of my rooms and sit there for a whole day watching the traffic go past. You know, all in their lanes, all more or less in the speed limit, all taking care of each other and watch it for hour after hour after hour because that's how you formed your initial assumption. And when the traumatic event happens, it shatters that assumption irreversibly. You know, because something has happened that I never believed would happen and once it's happened, it could happen again, it could happen next time. This car might be going to do it. It might happen any time. I'm not, I'm not safe, I'm not going there. Uh, do you see? That's the anxiety. Anxiety is contained by security, predictability, uh, and so on. And so the danger with the trauma of an event like this is that we shift our assumptions so that they are rebuilt around that event. And every time the wind blows, I think I might be going to die. Right? That's then creating a post-traumatic stress situation where you just don't feel safe. And I know some of the people who live in the Dandenongs, uh, I was told, were saying, I'm not sure I want to live here anymore. I thought it was a beautiful place. I think I want to go down. And I know people who moved out of the area where I live right down into somewhere like Camberwell or something where they're completely uh, away from fires and they had a beautiful environment. They don't feel safe. So that assumption is shattered. Um, now, what we have to do is we have to learn to actually rebuild our assumptions. How do we rebuild the assumptions? In the same way in which they are built up the f in the first place, by the repeated experiences of things being the way they are, unless we have too much climate change. Uh, but can you see that therefore it's absolutely inevitable that you have to be ready to work through a few 
windy winters before you get this one into perspective. This, you know, I don't know what, what they rate it as, you know, one in a hundred or something, is it? Uh, so, so uh, whatever that means in terms of our experience. But, but do you see that you, we've got to be prepared, but we must work constructively with these experiences so that we re rebuild healthy assumptions that we can live with rather than being sort of closed in to a dangerous little narrow space where we never feel comfortable as long as the wind blows. A and so there's a lot of work to be done, uh, which means we've got to think about what's happened. Uh, we've got to understand wind speeds. I know in Christchurch they got very, very good at being able to guess the, uh, you know, the, the size of the earthquake. They'd stop and, you know, I think this will be a 3.6, I'd say, maybe 3.7. That's all right. Oh, this is a bigger one. This must be a 5. Uh, you know, and so they're actually learning to read. And then towards the end of the time, when they weren't having so much, they'd feel a bit of a trembling. And they'd say, is that a truck or is it an earthquake? Is that a truck or an earthquake? A truck. Uh, it's a truck. It's OK. It's a truck. So they started to discriminate the different kinds of vibrations. So they're working to rebuild the sense of safety. Um, and this is something we have to do. Now, there's something that gets in the way of that. And that is a, a property of the way our minds work when we're in danger. Uh, now, once we experience any kind of threat, um, take a simple example. Do you have snakes up here? Think of the last time you nearly trod on a snake. I nearly trod on a copperhead snake about uh, two weeks ago. I didn't think it would be there. And suddenly it wriggles out from under my feet. In, uh, and I made such a guttural uh, sort of noise that my two-year-old grandson beside me just uh, laughed his head off. He, he didn't see that. He just think, what's grandpa making this strange noise for? But, ooh, ooh, you know, this, it comes from deep inside in your instinctive part of your, your being. Uh, and, you, you know, you find yourself levitating backwards at a great rate because that kind of immediate experience just cr converts into action to resolve it. That's the difference with anxiety, by the way. Fear is fear of, of something that's here and therefore translates immediately into some kind of action. Anxiety is fear about something that might happen. And you can't do anything about it because it hasn't happened yet, so I feel really helpless. And it's a very unbearable feeling. Uh, and that's a part of what comes up when, when we start to get this re-experiencing. Is this wind going to be this, that or the other? Now, the what enables us in that state to be so effective is that a whole series of changes happen in our brain and in our mind driven by predominantly adrenaline. And there are several main ones. First of all, we get a narrowing and tunneling of attention onto the problem. That's useful, isn't it? Because we don't get distracted. We just focus on the snake or we just focus on the wind. We forget everything else. And what also happens is we shut down our own uh, emotions, by and large, so that we, we translate into action. And people say they didn't have any feelings at the time. They were just they were in a very heightened state, but they're just doing things. The reactions come afterwards. If you've ever been in a near miss in a car, for instance, uh, you'd think you'd be frightened, but you haven't got time to be frightened. Uh, it also focuses our mind on uh, in the right side of our brain where we process information about the physical world as we can see it, the sensory motor world, the movement and, and perceptions, because that's what's going to save us from a snake or a charging bull or, or even a bushfire coming, isn't it? Where's it coming? How fast do I have to move? Where's it going to go next? It's all about that. So actually we come really focused down on the pure physical environment. Uh, and the other thing it does is it makes us egocentric, right? Because survival is about my survival. Now, if I've got uh, people with me 
and I'm a reasonably civilised human being, I'll probably help them too. But the research shows that people do much the same, most people do much the same, whether it's their nearest and dearest or someone they've never seen before. If there's a physical opportunity to help them, they help them. So that we like to, and we've all been, um, uh, you know, confused by Hollywood movies where the hero and the heroine, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And they, the hero runs towards the heroine against all the crowds that are running away and all that sort of stuff. That's not actually what uh, real behaviour is like. It's predominantly, being a hero comes down to having a physical opportunity. Not everyone will do it, but most people will do it if they can. They'll help each other, just because they're another human being. Um, and in that moment, you're in a very uh, sort of focused state of mind, down to the bare bones of human existence. It's a really profound experience. And what happens then is, you actually end up not having a clear sense of the whole unfolding of the event, but you get what uh, the psychologists call flashbulb <laughs> memories, those flashes. You, you, you would know that from uh, you know, having some near miss in the car, and as you sort of get through it and you go, go to bed that night, you just have these flashes. Because we don't have the, we now know, we don't have the processing power in that state to put everything together. So we end up with fragments. And the fragments will be the most dangerous moments, won't they? Because they're going to be most strongly imprinted in our minds. So can you see that if you just sit with those fragments, you set up loops of post-traumatic intrusive re-experiencing? Can you see how that follows? Uh, which is why it's terribly important for people like Red Cross to come and see people afterwards and, and help them just settle down and start putting it all together. But we won't put it all together in the, in the early stages because we, we just can't remember it all. But it comes back, doesn't it? Now, what I've noticed is that um, people who don't have a lot of other problems you know, some people will be very traumatised straight away and really need some help. Um, I was actually talking to a couple of counsellors from uh, an agency that deals with traumatised people. Um, and uh, one of the counsellors talked about a young woman who'd had a very traumatic experience and she'd had it about 10 days before and she was really struggling and she came straight. The other one, um, the person had had a very traumatic and tragic experience. And he was an older person and he hadn't come for some months. And when he did come, his priority was, how does he look after his family? And he doesn't want to address his trauma because he's got more important things to do. Now, this is a really important principle because if we can, we put our trauma aside and deal with more important things like talking to the insurance company of you know clearing the debris and, and doing all the things that enable us to reactivate our lives because of the chaos uh, and we might have family members to look after or neighbors to look after uh, and so on so so healthy people have a capacity to put a certain amount of trauma aside without doing anything to it so it's just put aside and then, what happens? Now, it's highly loaded traumatic experience. Maybe people thought they might be going to die. Uh, I've certainly heard stories of and, and spoken to people from the Dandenongs and heard stories up here that uh, sound to me like uh, if I was in that situation, I'd be thinking that maybe I'm not gonna make it. These are really important experiences, but you've got so much to do afterwards, you've just got to put it aside. And it's part of our self-respect to get control, put our emotions aside and deal with things. So what you get then is people's trauma coming up for processing at all sorts of different times. What the uh, Beyond Bushfires people have shown, something that we've known for a long time, is there's a sort of a graph where the 
the people, the number of people wanting support from uh, councillors and other people goes like this. There's usually a peak very early on and then there's another peak around about six months, around about now, and then the anniversary, and then 18 months. Uh, I was at a conference in the US where I saw the statistics from the New York uh, counselling service after September 11. And when they presented their statistics of referrals, it's exactly that loop. It's not just a matter of natural disasters. Uh, because I think it has to do with the, uh, the need for people to get on with their lives. If we can't get on with our lives, the whole thing becomes dysfunctional, doesn't it? Things just don't work. So it's a very big priority for us. And in order to do that, we put aside our experience. Now, because um, I was giving this uh, presentation to the psychologists, because I wanted them, I basically want them to get out of their offices and uh, mingle with community members and have informal chats with them. Uh, and they'll be able to do a lot of work uh, that they won't get to do otherwise. And of course, the people will have to make appointments as well. But what I uh, communicated to them was a, a huge study that was done in the US. Across the whole US, they sampled all sorts of people who had had traumas, all sorts of different traumas. And they found that the average time after the trauma that people actually went and sought help was 12 years, right? Terrible traumatic events. Now we know that that's, uh, I remember a, a woman who worked with US veterans came out a few years ago, had lunch with her, with other people, and she said they'd done a big study and the average time that discharged military personnel uh, come forward and ask for uh, help from their trauma is 10 years. Uh, what's, what's, what's everyone doing during this time when they've had horrible experiences? They shut it down. That takes energy, takes emotional energy. We all know what it's like to carry a worry around, don't we? And you're more likely to be short-tempered and irritable because you've got things on your mind. You can't concentrate so well. You don't enjoy stuff as much. You feel tired. Um, I've just come back from uh, Koryong and Malakuta in the last couple of weeks. People are feeling like that because COVID has cut across their processing. Now, when they look at this curve, they find that yes, the curve is there if you look at the whole population. But if you look at who's doing what, you'll find that each curve involves different people just have the number of referrals that means I need it straight away you need it in six months you need it in 12 months you need it in 18 months because our circumstances are all different uh, and uh, there'll be people who uh, we know from bushfires aren't ready to process their trauma until they've they've moved into their new house they've got everything settled and then everyone thinks oh you lucky person I wish I had a new house you're over it, but they're not over it. This is when they start to grieve for what they've lost and have their trauma waking them up at night with fear. Uh, and so I think it's important to remember this and to realise that uh, we uh, need to be patient with each other, that people will have their trauma come up at all sorts of different times, quite unexpectedly, or maybe something trivial, you know, maybe you have a little bit of a fright in the car or something, and suddenly it brings back the issue of, uh, of survival. Now, I want to say a couple of things about how we can work with this because when people tell the story, if you listen to them spontaneously, they will tell the story up until the most dangerous moment and then they'll break the narrative sequence, the story unfolding. I can give an example of this. Uh, I kept being told when I first went down to Malakuta about this young man who had um, uh, got all the gear and he, he went out behind his house to protect the house as the fire came out of the bush and they had a fire break. And what I kept being told was that 
when the fire came out, it was so huge that he realised there was absolutely nothing he could do and he thought he was going to be killed. And they said to me, you should see him. I never saw him, but, uh, you know, they said he was very traumatised because he thought he was going to die. Now, what are you wondering about? They didn't tell me he was dead, was he? Otherwise, they wouldn't know what he thought. He's alive. Are you wondering how come he lived when he thought he was going to die? Well, that's what we should wonder. You see, because he lived. Now, all we know is the traumatic bit of the experience when he thought he was going to die. And that's what we will find people will tell us when they talk to us about their experience on the night. Because that's the most dramatic. That's imprinted in the trauma part of our brain, if you like. And the thing we have to understand is that now, once you've got that and you keep telling that bit of the story, and usually they break out of the story and go into the emotions. And I bet if I talked to him, he would say something like, I've never seen anything like it. I didn't believe there were fires could be so big. I thought I was going to die. And then he'd probably say, Delp should have done more burning off. It's, it's this person's and the CFA should have come and I don't know what they're doing. And he'd, all of his traumatic emotion would convert into anger and frustration about somebody should have stopped this from happening. Uh, can you see what's happening? Now that will then just create a helpless bundle of emotion. Now every time something triggers a connection with anything in that sequence building up to that moment, it's going to go round in a loop, isn't it? It's going to go round and round in a loop. Anger, helplessness, frustration, settle down, remind it round and again. Now that's a post-traumatic loop. And the more we think about it in that way, and that means we get caught up in the frustrations. And I don't know what it's like up here, but most people after disasters have a lot of frustrations and anger with a lot of what they feel to be incompetence and inconsistency in government and lack of, because the, these systems don't do what we want them to do and they never, never, ever do them fast enough, right? Because we're all in this narrowed, egocentric focus, I need this and I need it now, why can't I have it? Uh, it's, we can't stretch our mind around how complex this is. Uh, so we've got this sort of background of high emotion anyway. So when we go around these loops, we're actually building a post-traumatic loop. And they've now been able to show with the brain scans how people who've got strong post-traumatic have a particular circuit in their brain that keeps getting reactivated by this. They can uh, follow it all through. Now, here's something we can do. You listen to each other. Could be your partner. Uh, you could even listen to yourself telling a story about it. Or you could listen to a neighbour or someone you meet over a cup of tea here and listen to their story. Now, here's what you can do is when they get to the point of greatest danger, just see where they go. There'll often be a pause where they look at you and they invite some em empathy and understanding. By all means, give it. Oh, that's terrible. That must have been an awful experience. But here's the next question you ask, because if you don't hold where you want to go, they'll suck you into their emotional loop. Uh, this should have happened and somebody did this and, you know. What you have to simply say is, what happened next? That's all, what happened next? So when, if I was talking to this young firefighter, uh, he said, it, when he describes the most disturbing bit and says, I thought I was going to die, and I'm thinking he's standing here, he must have survived somehow. So I want to find out. Because it's not in his memory loop, is it? So every time he remembers this, he's not going to remember how he survived, he's only going to remember how he nearly died. So therefore he's going to behave as though he died. Not quite, but nearly, right? So if I ask him what happened next, don't ask him how he feels, that'll take him back into the loop. He feels very upset that a horrible thing happened. But if you ask him what happened next, he'll have to tell you, won't he? And what you'll see is that often people suddenly, you've asked them an unexpected question, and you can see they sort of look, 
and you can see they've got to go somewhere else in their mind to a different memory system which is a memory system for reassuring information as opposed to threatening information. They go into different memory systems. The scientists are gradually working this out, but you can actually see it. They look and they say, oh, uh, well, I, uh, I put the hose over me, or I ran around the building, or I did this, I realised that uh, I couldn't fight the fire, and so I thought I've got to get out of here. And you can say to them, that was a good judgement. What made you so clear that this is what you should have done? <laughs> I can give you another short example. I was in Kangaroo Island just after the fires in South Australia. And afterwards a woman came to me and said, uh, I made some very stupid decisions and I nearly cost uh, my daughter and, and me our lives. Uh, they came and told me to evacuate because the fire was sort of around there coming and going for a number of days. The fire went past her house and then went back again and then she was told you should evacuate. She said, well, it's been here. I, I think we'll be all right. And she didn't evacuate. She and her daughter. And then she saw it coming and she thought, this is very dangerous. Uh, she thought of evacuating to the other end of the island. She thought, I think it's going to be too dangerous down that road. I'll go to the hillside that was burnt a few days before. That'll probably be all right. So she reasonable, inexperienced but maybe reasonable sort of idea. Uh, uh, yeah, I know, I'm listening to it, looking at the faces. <laughs> uh, uh, she drives to that hillside with her daughter, and this is what she's telling me, and I looked around and I realised it's not safe, this is not a safe place to be, this is not a good place to be. So she's actually recognised the danger, isn't, hasn't she? That's a really good thing. She's clear enough, this is not a good place to be. And then she says, I didn't know what to do next. And so I asked my question, so what happened next? Well, my daughter said, shouldn't we try and go to the other end of the island? And, uh, you know, it's, it's the only option, isn't it? So her daughter comes out and she's oh, all right. And then she describes in detail how she drives onto the road, gets herself right in, across the, the white line and crawls along in the smoke until it clears and then she flattens it as fast as she can until she hits the next smoke bank, then she stops and crawls along, keeps in the middle of the road, flattens it and so on. And in that way it gets out. Now actually two people died on that same road, but she made it. And she, does, isn't she driving well for the circumstances? Uh, trying to get there fast, but being very clear about the danger. Um, and uh, she feels she put their lives in danger. Well, she made a bad decision not to evacuate. But she also made a, well, I'll say, an inexperienced decision in going to the hillside. But then she made a good decision to realise it wasn't the right. But she didn't actually come up with the idea. So she's left feeling a failure. And I said to her, what would have happened if your daughter hadn't suggested that? What do you reckon would have happened? She probably would have gone anyway. It's the only option. She would have come up with it. How long do you think it would have taken you? Uh, ten seconds. It would feel like ten years, but you know. Uh, and so, so what I was able to show her is that. Now, she's got these fragments, and the fragments she remembers is her helplessness, her bad decisions, and then her sense of helplessness, and then her daughter answers the question, and uh, she has no sense of her own competence, but it's all there inside. If her daughter hadn't said it, they would have worked it out together somehow. Can you see? And so what we now do, and I said, that's what you've got to remember, not those fragments, but that somehow between you, you and your daughter muddled through and saved yourselves. What more can we ask? I said, I bet on the next fire you'll do a better job. Right? Because that'll be experience. Uh, because this is why people are so inexperienced. So, so this is something you can do with each other. Just try to get the story complete and take it through until people are safe again. That's the, the unit of memory that we have to hang on to. And if people keep processing that, you'll have to go through it a number of times. 
uh, to, to actually put it together. Uh, then I think it's how we gradually put it in the past and are able to say, yeah, I remember we had a horrible storm back in 2021. Uh, now I want to say a couple of words about grief. Grief and loss, whatever we lose. Now one of the key things about uh, loss is we lose something that is emotionally significant to us. And that is uh, the a meaning that things have for us. And that could be the bushland. Uh, it could be animals, it could be neighbours, it could be anything. And I think what's really important is to realise that when we do lose some, something important, uh, it's very hard for us to accept it. There's some, and it's that to do with that deep part of us that's based on assumptions and habits, uh, that things were always like this. I always loved this bush. It's gone and I feel I can't accept it. Uh, and anyone who's been through serious grief will know it takes a long time to accept the loss. And once you've accepted the loss, you can start to process it and, 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 and then think about how, how can I have my life now in the future and rebuild the life around the fact that what you lost is not there, but there are a lot of other things there. Um, and this is slow and painful work. But I think one of the things that's really important that comes up, which we're not always clear about, is what I, well, psychologists call our sense of identity, right? If you, if you build a house and you live in a beautiful block and you look at it every day, that bit of nature is a part of you. And we link ourselves. Uh, this is, you could say, the Western uh, version of what Indigenous people talk about as being owned by the land. We don't own the land, the land owns us is what they say. And this sense of identity that they have very much in the foreground. We have it, uh, I think, when, when people uh, attach themselves to a place, but it's in the background. We don't have a very good language about talking about this. And I think it's very important to think that there will be an irreversible change and, you know, if you go to places like Macedon and Cockatoo, uh, where Black Saturday devastated, you'll see there's a beautiful environment again. It's probably not the same, but it will be beautiful. And we have to be patient and then understand that uh, we have to actually accept that and, and ask ourselves, how do we have a creative moment here to rebuild a different environment? Uh, and, and that's something that we go back and forth from in the process. And one of the things that comes up, and it's part of this state of uh, be living in a disrupted lifestyle where we get preoccupied with all the immediate problems we have to engage in, uh, that, that we have to recognise that uh, we need to be aware of hanging on to the important values in our life. What's our life really about? What is important? Because when you're in that highly stressed state, you haven't got space in your mind to think about that. You're on the here and now immediate problems. And so what often happens down the track is if people haven't been stopping and thinking about uh, what does this mean for their lives, their life plan, their community, their, their sense of self, what's important to them, all of these things are liable to be influenced. If they haven't got an environment where they can think and talk about this, they suddenly get out the other end and they say, I don't know why I'm living here, I don't like it anymore. Where do you want to live? I don't know, it doesn't really matter. And, and there are some people that come out of disasters with a sort of an aimless loss of, of focus. And this is what we call identity. Now we can work with this by processing what it means uh, in our informal conversations, listening to each other, having someone interested makes me find words for vague feelings. This is very important stuff. It's more important for the long-term future than how fast the problem of the trees gets solved. Uh, that's about trees. This is about self, relationships, family, community. Uh, so, uh, and, and i just say, if we don't get too deeply into the stress, we do give attention to these things. In the stress state, we can't think of these broad issues. 
we get focused on the physical here and now. And uh, we can't afford to neglect these big issues for too long or we lose our direction. And uh, how do we hang on to it? Well, we have to keep stepping out of the stress, which means we got to be very clear the real priority is our quality of life and our relationships and our long-term goals, not uh, the damned trees and who should be doing what uh, and things like that. That'll all get gradually sorted out, for, but it'll take a long time. So uh, how do we actually get out of the stress? A very simple recipe, pleasure and leisure. Don't be ridiculous, you'll say to me. We haven't got time for that sort of nonsense. Don't you realise we've, you know? Now you can't afford not to, because it's no good fixing your place up and then not li enjoying living there, is it? Or being unwell, or being sick, I mean, uh, or having uh, relationship problems and so on. Pleasure means I restore energy because I'm doing something I enjoy that gives me satisfaction, that makes my life meaningful. Leisure is, I don't have to do anything. Don't be ridiculous, I've got all this work to do. No, you can set aside Sunday afternoon. Well, I won't know what to do with myself. Well, run around, run around the block a couple of times and then you might, you know, just because you'll tune into yourself if you carve out that leisure time. And if you enjoyed Sunday afternoon, Maybe try Saturday afternoon as well, and maybe Wednesday evening. Try to build a routine where you recapture some of this leisure time, because that's where the deeper processing goes on, where our mind can free wheel and sort of bed all this down and let it fade into the past while we hang on to what's really important in our lives. Um, we had a, I'll stop with this story. Uh, uh, we had a meeting in King Lake about four years after Black Saturday. There was then a lot of community angst and division and stress and we had this very turbulent meeting um, where people were totally focused on all the physical problems and so there was some, you know, a lot of them were sort of listened to and dealt with and then I was asked to say a few words about this sort of stuff. I'd already talked about it, you know, various times up there. And then there was a bit of a discussion and this woman said, uh, look, everyone's been saying how unhappy they are, but actually um, I'm enjoying decorating my new house. I never thought I'd ever have a new house to decorate. It's a lovely experience and I've been really enjoying it. And last Saturday, uh, I did this, that and the other, she described it, and then I sat down and had a cup of tea and then I thought to myself, now, what were the goals of my life before Black Saturday? And then she just said in a wistful voice, but I couldn't remember. You know, she's lost a connection. Now, if, if you stay stressed for too long, you start asking, what am I doing this for, don't we? It's absolutely predictable. If you just don't have any time out, you start to, you keep doing it, but you just, you're not, your heart's not in. So pleasure and leisure, and that's quality of life. And that's what the man from Macedon didn't do. He thought the priority was to rebuild his house, but it wasn't. It was to look after his marriage and his family in its most challenging year ever. And it wouldn't matter if he'd rebuilt his house over two years or five years. In 10 years time, he would have still had a family, wouldn't he? And I think that's the perspective we have to preserve and try and, and just work out how you can keep living during this very, very frustrating few years. Sorry, I've gone on for a long time here. But uh, I don't, don't know if anyone's got any questions. <laughs>